Hebrews 11, 1 to 3, faith in action. Now faith is confident in what we hope for and assurance about what we don't, do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe is formed at God's command so that what is seen it was, made, was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. An introduction that the lay preachers people have sent to us. There is no small irony in the fact that today we are celebrating those who are authorised by the Uniting Church to lead worship and preach the word. Yet we are warned by Isaiah against placing undue reliance on formal worship in our relationship with God. We recognise the knowledge and skill of preachers trained in exegesis and critical scholarship yet also knowing that in the end we confront deep mystery. Perhaps it is those who probe the scriptures most deeply are also the ones most acutely aware of the ultimate mystery of God. Today we acknowledge those who bring their secular life experience to the business of preaching in a way that lay preachers have always done and is now increasingly common among those called to ordain ministry. Life experience with all its complexities helps keep the preaching grounded in real life while at the same time presenting a wider and higher vision of what life in the communion of God can be like. Preachers, lay or ordained, know all too well the more we know, the more there is still to know. They are acutely aware that the writer of the letter to the Hebrews was right. The basis of our relationship with God is trust. We can have all the confidence and assurance in the world, but in the end, we are human beings in relationship. That is, something we take on trust, in faith. When I was advised that uh, this Sunday was to be Lay Preachers Sunday and sent the information, I thought I would... Um, Make adv take advantage of something we experienced at Woolerton Road in Beeston in England uh, a few months ago. It was a lay-led service and the leader that night invited a couple of people to choose a passage, to speak briefly about it and to choose a hymn. And it was well received. So I thought we could do the same here. So in a moment, Joan will take her part and then the people who were organising this with me said, you've got to do your part too. <laughs> All right. When we were in England, we went down to... Sorry, we're in Wales now. When we were in Wales, uh, where Jenny has a brother, we were wandering around Penarth one day and came across a Methodist church and the door was open and we went in and uh, found the administrator who was very kind and showed us around and eventually uh, we got a copy of the plan in that circuit, there are, not that one, there are 10 preaching places which have a service, ev nearly all of them have a service every Sunday, but thankfully they only have one night service. That's what their preaching plan looks like. And some of you know, uh, we spent a couple of years at uh, Beeston in Nottingham and with the superintendent minister and three or four others, the plan looked like that. It took two, two or three hour sessions to do the plan. In South Australia, we still, in some places, rely heavenly, heavily on lay preachers. Yesterday morning, I attended a Thanksgiving service for Margaret Canow House in the Colonel Light Church. Margaret was indeed one of the saints of the church. She was the daughter of Prim and Winifred Keek of the Congregational Church. Prim Keek was principal of Parkham College for many, many years. Margaret reached the grand old age of 102. Uh, her poems, her productions are well known in South Australia. But before the service, I was sitting next to somebody whom I didn't know, but we got chatting. He comes from a place called Cooley which is near Minleton on uh, York Peninsula. During winter, they hold services in their home. 
because the Cooley Wooty Church doesn't have any power. <laughs> so they gather as a fairly small congregation of eight to 12 people in the home, as they did in the early church, he reminded me. And I said, well, how often do you see your minister? Well, about once a quarter. He himself was a lay preacher and others came to take services. There are 10 congregations in that circuit and one minister, I understand. So you'll see in some parts of South Australia, lay preachers are still in heavy demand. Well, now we'll invite Joan to come and present uh, her presentation. When Doug asked me to choose a passage in the Bible that had meaning for me, it wasn't a hard choice to make. And I will read that now. I'm reading from Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Yodia and I urge Sinti to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The reason uh, these words, and particularly uh, starting at verse 8, where there is a list of thinking on what is pure and lovely and of excellence. Those words became living for me and able to be practised in my journey of forgiveness. I have found uh, a struggle with that. And it seems to me it has happened mostly when I have chosen to support the vulnerable, to stand apart from the mob, to, to support the hurting and the needy. This has happened to me in the family and in the workplace. And when I rescued a one-year-old little pup from euthanasia, and uh, quite often, the people who are hurting are thinking of themselves and not the one that needs support. The difficulty forget to forgive is, has, is, is it difficult the deeper the hurt, the bigger the struggle. And I think 
I find that it's, uh, you, you find yourself rehashing that hurt over and over, um, anger, feeling um, intimidated. These words would correct me. Was my thinking pleasing, commendable and worthy of praise? And was I at peace? No, a resounding no. So I would switch to thinking of something positive and good, and peace would return momentarily. But I would need to work on it and keep correcting myself. In time, in a situation, the journey of forgiveness changes. In one case, someone who had hurt me the most was dealing with sickness in her family. And I found, found I could reach out to support her. And complete healing transpired and we now have a precious and loving relationship. It was well worth the struggle, and I'm thankful for the guidance given in the living words of Paul's letter to the Philippians. And thanks be to the God of peace and healing. And uh, when that little group told me that I had to do my bit too, it was just after this passage in Luke chapter 9, the last few verses, had been the lectionary reading and really spoke to me. Luke chapter 9, beginning at verse 57. As they were going along the road, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And as I read that passage again, I thought, well, <clears throat> how often have I made excuses? Although Luke puts these three together, quite possibly it was separate incidents over some period of time, but they may have all happened together. How easy it is to make excuses. I think back, if I may be personal for a moment, quite a long time ago, <clears throat> when I was in college, it doesn't pay to get appendix, an appendicitis and a pelvic abscess in November. <laughs> so I didn't do any exams that year. I was allowed to do three SUPs but not five. So it took me another year to finish my BD and as soon as the results came out, Reverend Roger Brown, who was Methodist Overseas Missions at the time, said, congratulations, you've got your BABD, now we need fellows like you on the mission field. And he told me about a particular theological college and I sort of said to him, no, that's not me. <laughs> and I didn't do any more about it. About three months later, he rang up and said, the General Secretary wants me to speak to you. He thinks you'd be a good guy for Rabaul. Where's Rabaul? Well, Big New Guinea looks like that. Port Moresby's down there, Lay's up there, Medang's up there, Weewak's up there. Where's Rabaul? <laughs> well, I looked up the index and that's Big New Guinea. Way over here, there's East New Britain and Rabaul's right up the top there. After some prayers and talking with C.T. Simons, who was my boss in the Department of Christian Education at the time, I did something which was very, very naughty in Methodist days. Because in those days, this is in the uh, mid-60s, 
you were chosen for missionary training and at the end of your course you were assigned to where you would go. So I rather, I suppose, naughtily or cheekily said, well, if you want me for a bowel, okay, otherwise I'm staying where I am. And they accepted that. Which was very good for me because the principal at All Saints College in Sydney, the Reverend Frank White, knew where I was going and specified my training for Papua New Guinea and working amongst the Chinese and other expatriates in Rabao. He sent me off to the Chinese Presbyterian Church on Sunday mornings so I would get a little bit of an idea of Chinese culture, well in a sense expatriate Chinese culture. And right through my ministry there have been times when will you do this or will you do that? And at one stage when we were very happy at Colonel Light Gardens the plea came, will you please consider Mount Gambier? Which was a pretty difficult place at the time. By faith, Abraham followed. Jesus called the twelve and they followed. Jesus sent the twelve out on another occasion sent out the 70 or the 72 and they came back with words of what they'd been able to achieve of driving out spirits and healing the sick. There are still many, many challenges whether we're young or middle-aged or old in walking with Jesus day by day. And the song I chose was one from Iona Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let your, sorry, will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? And there's a whole lot more questions which we'll sing in a few moments. But then the last verse, Lord, your summon echoes true when you but call my name. Let me turn and follow you and never be the same. In your company I'll go where your love and footsteps show. Thus I'll move and live and grow in you and you in me. And as we sing this, let us make it our own.